Hi, I'm Don Dizon, Professor of Medicine at Brown University and Director of Women's Cancers at Lifespan Cancer Institute. And joining me today is Dr. Susanna Campos, Assistant Professor at Harvard Medical School and Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. Welcome to Medscape Oncology Insights. So today I thought what we'd talk about is not about the science of oncology, which both you and I and our colleagues cover quite well, but I thought it would be interesting to talk about work-life balance mm -hmm. more. Yeah. Um, it certainly isn't something you can cover in a course, uh, but you and I have been in practice quite a long time and we've seen uh, differences mm -hmm. in how institutions value our roles as clinicians, how um, the contribution lines that our research comes into this. And throughout it, it seems at least to me that um, while the demands increase almost every year, mm -hmm. um, the struggle to maintain yourself clinically um, becomes overpowering. And so I'm looking at you, quite successful, well-known gynecologic oncology expert. And I think what would be interesting is to know your take on how medicine has evolved mm -hmm. um, as you see it and how you've seen your colleagues who refer to you, how, how the pressures have laid on them. You know, it's true. It's a very good topic, actually, one that's actually very much in the limelight at, at this present point yeah. in time. And, it, you know, medicine has become more complex. You know, when we trained, you know, a few, hundred years ago, <laughs> you know, you know, things were a bit more simpler. You know, yeah. we, we knew cytotoxic chemotherapy, but it now it's much more complex. We really have to have a tremendous knowledge of the genetic makeup of the disease, of the genomic aberrations, and what those genomic aberrations may do. We are seeing patients now that are living longer, which is wonderful, of course, but with that comes a complexity, you know, yeah. a complexity of, you know, patients who come to you having seen five, six, seven, twelve prior lines of therapy, asking once again, you know, where is the next step? Mm -hmm. And this takes time. You know, this takes time in the clinic. You know, it takes time to see the patient, absorb the patient's needs, the complexity of the patient, the patient's family, um, and also to do all the reading that guides you. Mm -hmm. Not only to mention the fact that you're then interacting with many, many different disciplines, whether it be your own, for example, our GYN research group, Group, or it be our clinical immunology group or our phase one because we really kind of work as a village together. Yeah. So that's become, you know, when you think about it, when you run a clinic of 30 patients between you and your provider, your nurse practitioner, that's a lot of work. Yeah. That's a lot of time and effort. And then couple that, you know, which is all very enthusiastic because we all love that. That's what we want to do every that's single day. That's why we came into the that's business. That's exactly yeah. correct. That is what makes, it gives you a high. But there's a balance, you know, in terms of look, what are all the clinical um, material that you have to actually address? What are the metrics of the department that you have to meet? So these things have to be balanced. Yeah. And, you know, and we're, there's been a lot of discussion about burnout, you know, uh, about, you know, patients and physicians depersonalization. And this is a real subject, I think. And mm -hmm. as we get more and more complex, as more demands are made of us, as medicine becomes more complex, and we want to measure up to that, yeah. okay, that we need to find a way to balance that. Mm -hmm. And how have you seen throughout the years now um, the institution try to meet that? Uh, my experience has been in the multiple institutions I've been involved with, the metrics are never the same. That's right. You know, the units that define a successful practice right. shift. So there's no national standardization. And certainly when I started at, you know, Memorial Sloan Kettering as a new attending, it was very clear what the expectation was. And if you met it, you had no pressure to go beyond that expectation. Right. Yeah. Um, and they still allowed that time for academic pursuits, right. to open clinical trials. They allowed you to go to the meetings. They supported you financially to support a career in academics. And the trouble I see is that as, as um, time has passed and medicine has become more complicated, the demand has been increased on clinical productivity and not so much in the academics. But I'm wondering what your take is on all of that I, as I mean, well. I think it's true. I mean, we often, you know, spend some time, you know, talking among ourselves. We do more clicking than we do talking. And yeah. that, that's a little bit distressful when you think about it, when you're always on the computer and you're not really talking to the patient yeah. and you try to make amends for that when you're in the rooms. Um, you know, there. I think every institution tries to deal with this in a different way. Um, 
I'm perfectly, you know, capable of, you know, held, holding a load, but I like an efficient clinic, you yeah. know, making sure patients come in. Are you mm -hmm. prepared? Is everything ready for that patient to be seen? Um, every little minute counts. I would yeah. rather have a minute spent with the patient than me circulating the neighborhood just to find an extra piece of paper and so forth. So I think, you know, there's been a dialogue in, in at least our institution in talking about how to make a clinic more efficient, okay? Um, how to utilize our nurse practitioners in a way um, that they can see some patients and you can see some patients in such that hybrid of that clinical practice is much more powerful at the end of the day. Clinically, our you know level providers have so much more to give than perhaps we allow them to mm, give. But that also creates some time so that you can share with the patient and maybe you know put your effort into a little bit more of a complex nature, mm -hmm. or for example, engage in a clinical trial and yeah. so forth. That's yeah, absolutely yeah. at that point in time. You know, centers have now looked at wellness uh, centers. You know, looking at you know ways to build resilience. Mm -hmm. um, you know, work-life balance. It's a, it's a wonderful discussion, but at the end of the day, you have to look at what the culprit is. You know, mm -hmm. you know, it can't be a band-aid to what we have now, but it has to change the culture. Mm -hmm. it has to change the culture where we do have to spend more time with patients. Mm -hmm. Some, you know, what are RVU requirements? What are the metrics that every department wants us? How do we balance that in yeah. a clinic that's growing exponentially every day? Yeah, it's a question. I'm not so sure there's an answer right now, frankly. Yeah, and I think that's that's the dilemma. And I'm wondering, you know, both of us have seen folks enter our departments um, and some have stayed mm -hmm. many have not that's right that's right and you know what has been your take on the experience of the of those folks who you're in a position to mentor mm -hmm. as they start a clinical practice with the broader you know vision of one day running a cancer center or running their own division or run, being a director of some sort. What is your take on all of that? I mean, that? I think it's an honest dialogue with yeah. them. You know, you have to be a good clinician. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, but at the same time, you need to have some time to yourself so that you can become a good clinician. And that becomes writing a trial, yeah. reading, okay? We often leave reading to in the evenings or the weekends. People have to be knowledgeable. You're only mm -hmm. going to be good at what you do. You're only going to be able to direct if mm -hmm. you have the knowledge behind that. Mm -hmm. And you have to keep an open vision, too. You know, how to make a clinic run smoothly okay mm -hmm. what are the ins what are the outs um, sometimes it takes very little effort to be incredibly yeah. efficient mm -hmm. and get some other things done to be mm -hmm. honest with but an honest dialogue about how to utilize your time most appropriately mm -hmm. you know how to not get bogged down in certain little things yeah. how to be structure your time so that you will succeed and move mm -hmm. forward instead mm -hmm. of running in the same place do they, do they ever comment on uh, the emotional aspects of the job. I, I remember when I was yeah. first in attending, it seems like it's the first year curse that yeah. you're going to see every young woman with cervical cancer, right. yeah. every woman who was pregnant when they found their ovarian cancer. Exactly. And, you know, back in the day, they didn't live that long. That's right. And it just seems like when folks start not to do well, they, do, they don't do well in groups. Right. And so all of a sudden, this group of patients you have, you know, they all start dying. Yeah. One after the other. And it, it was emotionally exhausting. And I think it almost broke me, quite frankly. But I know. I think it is you, emotionally exhausting. And sometimes, yeah. you know, you see this so very often uh, that you forget how it affects some of our young colleagues, to be honest with you. Yeah. That it's okay to feel. You know, I've always, I was always told by someone, when you start feeling, then it's when it's time to get out. So understood. You know what I yeah. mean? You should feel. You know what I mean? You can't absorb every case. Yeah. Um, at the end of the day, I always say to our fellows, at the end of the day, it was every dot cross, you know, dotted and every T crossed. Was there anything that you could have done that you didn't do even not, not as a measure to look back in yeah. terms of blame, but as a reflection at the end of the day, you have succeeded. You've given yeah. this person a, in, as best of a quality of life, but you have to be mindful how it affects our young, our, ourselves yeah. for that matter, but also our young fellows that are mm -hmm. coming into the equation. They don't see this every single day. Um, and how to prepare for that mm -hmm. both physically and emotionally, frankly. I think that's a really good point that you raised sort of the idea of when you look back at a case, it's not to see where you went wrong. That's right. It's to reflect on the experience and what could you possibly, you know, gain from that experience. Right. Yeah. So today, what is your tips in terms of 
you know, you dealing with the emotionality of a cancer practice. I think we have to remember why we went into this, you know, enjoy your patients, okay? Mm, you know, get to know your patients, okay? And I think most oncologists and other disciplines also do. You know, when the kids are going to college, when there's mm. a special event in their life, okay? Enjoy them, okay? And most importantly, listen to them. You know, of all the next generation sequencing that you can possibly do, okay? Yeah. Genomic profiling up the bazoo, it's a very basic, just listen, to be mm. honest with you, but engage with them, you mm -hmm. know what I mean? It makes it much more uh, of an easy road. And, you know, delight when they succeed. Yeah. And, and you know, be sorrowful when they don't, you yeah. know, at the same time, because you're a human being, you know, you're taking care of these people every single day. Um, and if they see that, they understand who's on their side. Yeah. yeah. You know, I have a question for you about that. Um, and I'm sure you've had the same experience where I'll see a patient with a fellow and I'll walk into the room and say, how was your trip? You know, because I know that they went yeah. on a cruise. Or I'll say, you know, your daughter got married last month. How was the wedding? And fellows will come out and say, how did you remember that? So my question to you is, do you think that's a skill to be taught? or something that you're born with and you, know, you it's can't? A, you know, it's a good question, you know what I mean? I think it's probably a little bit of both, you know what I mean? Uh -huh. I mean, in some people it comes extremely easy. In, in, in many ways, it becomes part of being a physician, the fun of being a physician, yeah. knowing your patients, okay? Absolutely, I totally and, agree you know, knowing you my patient's daughter got married mm -hmm. in September, seeing the pictures, getting yeah. them on the internet, you know, yeah. uh, when they share that with us. Um, it also can be taught, okay? And it can be, you can make our fellow, you know, teach our fellows to be mindful of the fact that it's okay to interact with our patients. It, it's okay to interact. Yeah. It makes it so much easier mm -hmm. and um, in essence, so much more fun. Mm -hmm. um, and they trust you so that mm -hmm. when you do have to engage in a discussion that is actually not fun at all, okay? Mm -hmm. They understand that you have their back. Yeah. That's extremely important, yeah. Yeah, I think, I, I'm not sure. I, if you it's can. Not, yeah. I mean, I think there, like anything else, there's some people you can teach and there's some people you can't. You know, I, I have think... actually, so I've taught my fellows now, you know, if something is happening in their life, write yourself a note when you open that chart. It's the first thing absolutely, you're going to see. Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. You cannot remember or you're not sure. Yeah, absolutely. Teach yeah. yourself yes. to remember. Right. Recognize what's important to your patient. Exactly. And if you have to write it down, so it's that, you know, you get that nudge. Right get the nudge. Absolutely, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. It, in, it it opens a door that you'll yeah. never that will never be closed actually. Yeah, I are you concerned at all in, in because cancer is becoming so precision based and it's so genomically based? Mm -hmm. Are you concerned about the humanism? in oncology. Does that bother you? Are you worried about that at no, all? Uh, no, not really, to be honest with you. I think that's very much intact. I mean, I only know this discipline, you know what yeah. I mean? But this discipline is, in essence, a very humane discipline. You know, you're yeah. not dealing with simple matters, okay? You're dealing with uh, things that are, you know, very mm -hmm. challenging. Like, in, every day can be a very challenging task. Um, I don't think it's, it, it's just that. I think it's more complex mm -hmm. behind the scenes. Um, it creates more stresses, yeah. you know, there's no question about it, but I don't think it, it shies away because, you know, we've all had that patient with that mutation whose disease has responded beautifully, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. And that is a delight. So it is really is, you know, it, 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 you, get, you get a union of both. So I, I wouldn't say necessarily that because we're spending a lot of time on molecular mm -hmm. and genomic aberrations that it might subtract from yeah. that. I don't think so, you know what I mean? I think we're gonna have to weave around it a little bit, yeah. Okay. Well. I'm gonna say that I know you, and I've known you for a very long time, and I know you as a, an exceptional clinician. Thank you. So my final question before mm -hmm. we close, um, how have you done that? How have you kept, um, how have you kept intact? Into, you know, that's a very good question. I mean, because there are days when you're not intact, right? Mm -hmm. Isn't that an honest approach? You know, like there are days where you're just simply um, very fatigued and yeah. you go home feeling a little dark, you know, mm -hmm. in all honesty. Um, but there are days where when you have this amazing response and you mm -hmm. change people's lives, okay? Um, even if it's not forever, but for some time, okay, um, that it changes you and it brings you up again. So it's yeah. a balance, to yeah. be honest with you. You know, yeah. you think you remind yourself also, like, you know, 100 years ago when I was a, a resident at Georgetown, I remember this one particular case. It was a young woman, actually. She was probably in her late 40s in retrospect, and um, 
as an intern, you know, you are to draw every blood in the, in the hospital in one evening. <laughs> and in no word of a lie, I always remember this case. And I, I remember going to her room because I had to get some CBC, who knows, right? And she was incredibly anxious, okay? Um, she had metastatic breast cancer mm -hmm. in 1992. So very different than it was, that it is today, right? Yeah. And she was not interested in me drawing her blood, okay? She was interested in someone just sitting and talking to her. That changed that day that changed my career path to be mm -hmm. honest with you because really she just wanted somebody to listen to her you know she'd do the cbc the ptinr she just wanted somebody to listen to so it's very important when you do this field that you want to give but you have to remember that you have to have it to give and yeah. it's important to protect yourself That's fascinating. you have to have it to give and it's quite important to protect yourself by having mm -hmm. protected time going on vacation turning the pager off yeah what a novelty yeah yeah absolutely I think that's a really important life lesson. Yeah. And I, I'm hoping that the audience hears that quite well. I love that. You know, um, you have to want to give, but you have to have it. To give. To give. I think that's fantastic. Absolutely. Thank you so you, thank much you. for joining me. <laughs> You're very welcome. Um, and thank you so much for joining us. And on behalf of uh, Dr. Campos and myself, we really do hope that what we talked about will help you in your life and in your career as an oncologist. Thank you.